Welcome to today's program, dear learners. I am Pallavi Gagoy of KK Handik State Open University. And in today's program, which I have titled The Penasa, it is one of the movements which is very critical in the development of English, sorry, in the development of the history of English literature. I would like to start the program with a table of contents so that you know what to expect in the program. First, the objectives, followed by an introduction to the Renaissance, which I have subdivided as Humanists and Humanism, Protestant Reformation, the context of England, and then the Renaissance ideal, the Renaissance man, and finally, winding up with a glance at literature and writers of English Renaissance. So here are the objectives for today's program. The design program will enable you to discuss Renaissance as a major period in the revival of learning. Explain how the period of Reformation and Humanism stemmed from the Renaissance. Because these are very important uh, parallel movements, as you will find. Learn about the Renaissance ideal and the Renaissance man. And finally, appreciate the emergence of the Renaissance from the medieval ages. I'm sure you have read about the medieval ages in the history of English literature. So this is a continuation from that and in fact an emergence. So let us begin with the introduction to the Renaissance. You must be facing sometimes the problem of understanding what this term exactly means. Actually it's a term which in Italian means rebirth or to be reborn. In Italian Renaissance is Renascimento. So, in English, the term Renaissance has been taken from the Italian term Renascimento and refers to the birth of learning. So, the Renaissance, as I said, is a cultural movement in Italy, which first began in Italy in the 14th century with renewed interests in the field of classical learning and spread about a century later to the other parts of Europe. You can just take out a map and look at how the whole continent Europe is spread out and how from Italy, starting from Italy, uh, that is at the south of Europe, how it spread towards the north as a phenomenon. In fact, today Renaissance is, uh, is uh, likened uh, to enlightenment, general enlightenment uh, in the globalization context in a larger, wider frame. Uh, so it refers basically to the concept of enlightenment. Enlighten enlightenment as in moving away from uh, the previous ages a shadow. So it, in fact, the Renaissance, although it took place in the 14th century in Italy and later came to England in the 16th century and um, in the modern period, enlightenment is knowledge as we know it. Uh, so it is basically a period where learning gained importance. Renaissance is likened to the emergence of man into the light of knowledge of the new world from the assumptions of the Dark Ages. So, the revival of classical antiquity started with the fall of the Byzantine Empire. The Greeks were known as the librarians of the world. And when Constantinople was uh, seized by the Ottoman Turks in history, as you will find, what had happened is that the Greeks, the Greek scholars had uh, fled to Italy and made um, Italy their homeland. And this is how they spread uh, and disseminated the knowledge, and especially the classical knowledge, which they uh, were, were the doings of. All right? So the Greek and the Roman classical models had reached Italy and engaged the Italian minds with an intense pursuit for the love of wisdom and knowledge. Now you will note the important contributions of the Renaissance were the invention of the printing press because the printing press was gaining ground and in a way disseminating knowledge because uh, there was circulation of uh, uh, varied materials and books were published um, and even though first it started with the immovable types of uh, you know press uh, later on it, but the movable press uh, printing press enabled a larger production of books and other forms of reading materials which uh, disseminated knowledge. Uh, then modern navigation because now unlike the earlier uh, medieval ages um, economy 
now the economy was changing because the world was spreading and there was much more knowledge of other parts of the world which is why modern navigation had opened up to the newer world and you will mark that Italy was at base that is at the south and the seas were open and so they ventured out into the seas and and this um, had brought about modern navigation in a big, big way and in fact all the European countries later on had explored the seas and other nations discovered nations anyways the next important point is that the important contribution is that the new approach to the study of history and modern sciences so these um, subjects were you know given more importance the rise in industrial and commercial activities like I said because of navigation because of trade because of expanding trade so there was a rise in industrial and commercial activities and the restructuring of the social classes because the social classes were now rising up and uh, you know there was a change from the early ages frame of society so to say so Giorgio Vasari had invented the term Renaissance in his book Lives of the Most Excellent Italian Architects, Painters and Sculptors from the Simbacu to Our Own Times. Yes, it's a long name, but it, this is a very important work because the term Renaissance had come up in this work itself. So this was in 1550. In the words of an accomplished representative of the Italian Renaissance, that is Leon uh, Battista Alberti, you'll do well to remember these names, he had said that a man can do all things if he wills, and this itself expresses the essence of the Renaissance ideal, the Renaissance man, which we'll come to in the later slides. The gifted people of the Renaissance sought an all-round development, that's a holistic development in all the areas of knowledge, in the arts, emphasizing on physical growth and social accomplishments. So the intellectual and cultural movement of the Renaissance began in Italy in the late Middle Ages, spanning uh, roughly from the 14th to the 17th century and gradually spreading to the rest of Europe, like I said. So it will, you will know that this is not a confined movement and it was spreading out in a big way. So um, the torchbearers of knowledge were, you know, extending it and expanding um, the whole world. The whole world was the, uh, their window. Um, it was laid out for them to explore, to learn about. So reason in this uh, particular time, reason uh, and not religion as it was in the Middle Ages, a reason became the driving force in the search of uh, defining the essence or the centrality of human beings in the Renaissance world. So man was important now. Earlier it was uh, more a God-centric world in the medieval ages, but now man was the center. Okay? And as a whole, the Renaissance could be viewed as an intellectual approach. Intellectual, that is, you know, in terms of knowledge, in terms of uh, wisdom, in terms of learning, in studying the secular and the worldly, and mind you, not the religious, as in the previous age, through the revival of classical learning and the novel approaches to thought. So, this brings us to the subsection humanists and humanism. Why? Because humanists or humanism itself implies that man was given centrality in the Renaissance world. Humanist scholars shaped the intellectual landscape. Humanism was more a method of learning and different from the medieval scholastic mode. Humanists studied uh, original ancient texts and assessed their values through the combination of reason and empirical evidence. Now you will do well to note that the Studia Humanitatis was formulated based for humanist education by way of which the five humanities subjects of humanities were given importance like poetry, grammar, history, moral philosophy, and rhetoric. All right. So, the great classical religious texts were promoted by humanists Lorenzo Valla and Erasmus. Desiderius Erasmus was a very important figure in the Renaissance. What brings us to the parallel movement, Protestant Reformation. Now, you may be wondering, what is Protestant Reformation? Why Protestant and why Reformation? These two terms are very significant. And you will do well to know that the Protestant Reformation was a parallel movement to the uh, Renaissance. This paved way for the 16th century Protestant Reformation, which was initiated by Martin Luther and um, John Calvin and other Protestant reformers. Protestant because they had moved away from the earlier religious or Catholic Church. 
they had moved away because they started questioning the authority of the church in the lives of hum uh, in the lives of people in society in fact even their uh, power over the crown so the protestants what they did was they decided that it was time that we question these religious ideals these religious doctrines and their dogmatic practices and uh, bring change in the people's mindsets about religion as such they emphasized on man how man saw religion how man through the study of the bible itself the pope or instead of having some church deacon and anybody else mediate on their behalf because earlier you will know um, that uh, the church was so dogmatic that did not let the bible was uh, not available to people at large and they were the ones who from the pulpits propagated religion they even uh, took up law uh, and in a big way they um, they had kind of uh, subjugated society although the society then did not realize it because they were religiously blind but now uh, the renaissance mindset was such that they started questioning this very aspects so the people they started protesting the fake doctrines the rituals the mal practices within the church and the systemic corruption of the church's roman hierarchy that is uh, why i said Rome, why i say roman hierarchy is because i refer to the pope or the papacy all right so now you in today's context you will know that there are two main denominations the catholics and the protestants all right so uh, the protestants were the ones who protested against the uh, dogmatic practices of the catholic church you will see this is a very uh, in a in a way it's a very modern way of looking at uh, you know at at every aspect at every institution in in fact in the whole world okay the way of looking at the world it was a uh, wholly new it was very different the importance of this movement was huge because the centuries of religious faith attitudes and beliefs were suddenly replaced by a new way of thinking so it was a whole intellectual shift so to say a cultural socio cultural shift the protestantism had originated with martin luther's 95 thesis in wittenberg now you may be wondering what is that actually martin luther who was a german protestant leader who had led this uh, reformation movement what he did was that he nailed on the church door of you know catholic church in wittenberg in the year 1517 uh, his life was taken basically uh, in 1521 because he stood up to protest so this caused uh, the further spread of religious individualism now it was no more a collective uh, kind of an approach to uh, the church to the religion and um, you know all kind of social cultural practices it was now individualistic much like uh, you know the modern age where things are more individualistic so back then in the 14th 16th century you will notice how uh, they were already you know moving into the modern uh, without knowing of course we see this now from our point of view as you know early modern but at that point of time they were unconsciously they uh, they were they were modern without really knowing that could be called uh, modern so this brings us to the context of england england because we are doing english literature and we take the context of england uh, primarily for our study uh, the renaissance which had reached already reached its peak in italy in the early 16th century which happened much later in England uh, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I from 1558 to 1603. The English Renaissance note, that is roughly, these are just, uh, these are not watertight, you know, dates, uh, or, you know, there's no, there's, you cannot really say that uh, Renaissance began from exactly this particular year to this particular year. This is just a way of marking the uh, movement from 1485 to 1660. A cultural and artistic movement in England dating from the late 15th century to the early 17th century brought the rapid growth of modern science, mathematics, astronomy and navigation. So the tradition of English literature gained strength and importance with the coming of the printing press by the mid 16th century because the printing press um, in England uh, came later on and uh, John Caxton in England in a big way brought up uh, the printing press. All right. So all the Tudor monarchs of the century were highly educated and so were most of the nobility. Uh, Queen Elizabeth was herself a product of Renaissance humanism and was trained by Roger Ascham. So people were well educated and they were open to learning. 
the systems of learning had opened up in a big way, which in a way can be also called the early modern. Anyways, uh, this brings us to the Renaissance ideal. Now, you may be wondering what is the Renaissance ideal? Modern historians are of the opinion that the Renaissance, much a precursor of the characteristics of the modern period, constituted a multiplicitous culture, that is, a culture which was heterogeneous, which was multiple in its forms. It was just not one particular culture that was uh, the context. It was you know, various different cultures taking place because of the opening of knowledge and opening of uh, uh, man's views and perceptions. Um, these uh, features include parallel Protestant reformation, which I just talked about, the invention of new philosophy, there were new philosophical strands coming up, philosophers discussing new ways, new thoughts, etc. Yeah? The Hermetic and uh, Neoplatonic traditions, because uh, Neoplatonic, because uh, there were people like uh, Marcilio Ficino and uh, Pico della Mirandola who uh, were Neoplatonists, they discussed the works of Plato. Like I said, uh, the Renaissance uh, ideal was also one which took uh, into the context of uh, the Greek classical learning or the uh, ancient and classical, uh, you know, treasures um, and incorporated them into their uh, learning systems, alright? So, an all-round development of art and culture took place, which is why it again defines the multiplicitous culture and the dissemination of the religious scriptures in all vernacular languages. Because this happened because this dissemination in the local languages, the vernacular languages, happened because of the printing press itself. So you can see how this, these are parallel movements ha happening, one factor leading to the other, printing press, and then again um, the, uh, you know, uh, the Renaissance anyway is taking place, and then uh, the Reformation taking place, and, and even the printing press helping in the spread of, uh, uh, in the spread of sorry, in the spread of uh, literature in a big way, and again, um, the printing press helping in the dissemination of uh, the protests of the you know, protestant leaders in a big way. So the, uh, the printing press played a great role here. All right? So the world was not closed anymore. It had, it had just you know, begun to open up instead of being, uh, being shrunken, instead of uh, shrinking, it was now opening up in a big way. So um, according to the Renaissance ideal, humanists first of all had a rounded approach to education and the ideals for the Renaissance gentlemen or courtier, one who the uh, gentlemen who were in the courts, etc. And according to the Renaissance ideals, such a figure was expected, that, uh, uh, particularly the Renaissance gentleman, was expected to speak several languages, that is, be a polyglot, play a musical instruments, write poetry, ride horses, be physically active, and do all kinds of things. You know, to be multi-talented, which is why again this brings us to the term multiplicitous culture. So uh, during this time, the universities, which were highly regarded, did not specialize in specific areas, but provided a broader education. It was because it, this was just in the wake of you know uh, the Enlightenment uh, period. It was just happening. Uh, things were just getting shuffled up, and you know uh, there was this sudden shift from the medieval age to the Renaissance. So it was gradual. It was a gradual process. So universities were gradually opening up. It was not like it just suddenly happened out of the blue. This, this was a gradual process. So universities were um, you know, offering broader education and after students received such an education they could choose to master a specific field. So they were, first of all this all-round development was taken care of and then uh, specifying uh, particular interests uh, was given uh, importance. So but what did it make? It made the Renaissance man. The Renaissance man represented a person who strived for excellence to develop his capacities as full as possible, both mentally and physically. The common term Renaissance man is used to describe a person who is well educated and who excels in diverse fields and subjects. All right? So uh, Leon Battista Alberti said that a man can do if he wills. So he himself uh, Alberti himself was uh, gifted in many fields. He was a Roman Catholic priest, an architect, a sculptor, a painter, poet, scientist, mathematician, inventor, archer, skilled horseman. So he was multi-talented. So this is what it means to be uh, the Renaissance man, to be uh, you know, an all-rounder in all fields, to strive for the best 
uh, in all fields. The exemplary figures of the ideal Renaissance man were Leonardo da Vinci, I'm sure you must have heard about him, Michelangelo, Galileo, Copernicus, Francis Bacon, among others who excelled in multiple fields of humanities and the sciences. Right? With man as the center of the Renaissance world, like I said earlier, it traces how the Renaissance man evolved in diverse fields uh, and every aspect. All right? So Renaissance, which highlights uh, this period as transitional one, because transitional because it was a big shift, one leading to the modern world. So this is uh, the first starting of the modern, like I said, early modern. Thus, the Renaissance movement marked a distinct shift from the medieval to the Dark Ages. So, this brings us to the final glance at literature and writers of English Renaissance, which we can explore in another program. So, to list some of the important literary forms of the English Renaissance, that is, travel writing. For example, Walter really uh, wrote his ambitious The History of the World. There was the form of pamphleteering, that is, pamphlets written by writers like uh, Thomas Decker, um, for example, The Seven uh, Deadly Sins of London. Then the early Tudor and Elizabethan poetry. Poetry had flourished in a big way, like for example, White and Surrey's poetry, Edmund Spencer's poetry. You can see the names are given here. Philip Sidney's uh, poetry. And there were many poets at this point of time. And also there was a tradition of the sonnet. All right? uh, Philip Sidney uh, had Philip Sidney practice uh, this uh, form. And this was also, in a way, inspired by a uh, Petrarchan form of the sonnet. Um, the English sonnet was very different, Shakespearean sonnet was very different and very differently uh, written. The short, crisp, it always contained a very different, um, distinct uh, ending, especially in the two last two lines of the poem, okay? That is uh, known as the couplet. Anyways, you will do well to, uh, to you know, to uh, learn about these forms in details. Uh, this is just a brush up. Uh, the Elizabethan prose, for example, by Francis Bacon, um, you know, uh, in a big way, Francis Bacon had brought out um, the form of essay writing also. So uh, prose writing was uh, very much in practice. Elizabethan drama, for example, uh, Christopher Marlowe had written his Dr. Foster's, and we cannot forget, we can uh, ever ever forget, um, the tragedies and comedies of William Shakespeare, uh, which you'll do well to explore on your own. The 16th century was the golden age of English drama. To list some of the prominent literary figures of the English Renaissance, you have uh, Ben Jonson, Christopher Marlowe, Edmund Spencer, Francis Bacon, James Shirley, uh, John Donne, John Fletcher, John Ford, John Webster, Philip Messinger, Philip Sidney, Thomas Decker, Thomas Cade, Thomas Moore, Thomas Nash, so many Thomases, Thomas Wyatt, William Rowley and William Shakespeare. Now you may be wondering why is William Shakespeare the most important, uh, you know, figure in uh, in the in English literature at this particular period of time uh, at the end? Because um, simply because this is just arranged in a alphabetical order, all right? So you uh, we will uh, explore the these um, forms of writing and the writers and their works in another program. All the best to you. With this, I end today's program. Thank you, dear learner.